1998, the Source magazine called the Stretch Armstrong with Bobito radio show the greatest hip hop radio show of all time. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Stretch Armstrong and Bobito. How you fellas doing today, all right? Not bad. You got a mic. <laughs> that was a yes? Chilling. Okay, okay. Yes. yes and no questions only. Okay. Um, I guess uh, 1998, all right? You've been named greatest uh, hip-hop radio show of all time. You guys are fans, obviously, of hip-hop radio in New York. How did, that make you, how did that make you guys feel at the time? Do you feel like you were, you were deserving of that title? Well, if, if anyone remembers that, issue of the source there was a photograph in it and um anyone any remember that no <laughs> remember my haircut no <laughs> crazy crazy everyone across the world saw that and it was very embarrassing but um i don't know for me um some of my my earliest hip-hop experiences um were me listening to the radio in in the 80s in new york and um that was a i mean that was an incredibly formative and um just I mean, that was an essential part of, of my even becoming a DJ in the first place. I mean, the first time I, I knew what scratching was was from hearing it on the radio. And I mean, I, I didn't know what it was, but I wanted to find out. Um, so obviously, um, you know, getting, you know, getting that kind of accolade was, was uh, tremendous. But um, of course, I took it with a grain of salt because to me, what we were doing um, was, uh, for me, was, what, was never what... Uh, I mean, it, it didn't measure up to what Marley and, and Chuck and Red were doing in the 80s, which was, I mean, to me, that was the ultimate. But, but it felt great. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I can say that uh, I remember being humbled by the award. Um, taking a step back and similar to Stretch, like thinking about all the people I grew up listening to. I did college and community and mixed show promotion for Def Jam from 1989 to 1993. So... It wasn't just like I listened to Marley Mall and, and Pete Rock and Kevy Kev and Special K and Teddy Ted and the Dirty Dozen and Red Alert and Prince Messiah. Like, I knew them. They were friends of mine. They invited us to their shows. We invited them to, to our show. It was a, a real community. And it was beyond that because if everybody remembers, you know, to bring it to the, to the Bay, King Tech and Sway were on that, that top three list of all time. So... And we knew their pedigree, you know, in terms of having a, 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 a syndicated show. That's something that Stretch and I always aspire to, actually, to be nationwide, you know, which we eventually wound up being just by virtue of hand-to-hand -hand cassette dubs and people bootlegging our tapes. Worldwide, and really, you know? That was worldwide, yeah, yeah that was worldwide. This is pre-internet. But, um, but, you know, when I looked at it and... and after being like shocked and, and, and surprised and happy, I actually said like, yeah, you know what, we do deserve that. Because what Red and, and Marley and, and Mr. Magic and Chuck Chilla, all those people did in the 80s was great. <clears throat> but what we did, we, we took it uh, a step different, that's all. We just changed the face of, of rap radio. We had four hours of programming, which none of them had commercial free, which none of them had. Stretch would play a Gigi Allen record. <laughs> if you know Gigi Come Allen. On. Come on. <laughs> no, but I'm just saying like Stretch you know, broke that's Gigi we, Allen we, with the hip hop. That's a market. footnote. <laughs> that's a footnote. I'm just saying like we we had a lot of liberty to liber <laughs> liberty to do things that other stations either didn't have the courage to do or just lega leg lega legally <laughs> <laughs> legality. <laughs> the legality to do. <laughs> I think that's where you're trying to go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> I mean, okay, the things about the show that people always point to in terms of why it, it was such a great program. Obviously, you know, the record's being broken. The... Um, <laughs> the freestyles, the, the different acts that premiered, you know, on your show. But I think beyond all that, um, to me anyways, from being there and listening for those years, 
is that the show represented something um, in terms of a community, in terms of an era in New York. You know, we're talking a lot about New York City in light of the Academy being in New York this year, and this fall. And to me, that was always one of the great things about the show is you guys are native New Yorkers. Your, your tone, your style, how you talked, how you snapped on one another, how you snapped on the callers, everything was so much a part of, um, you know, in the blood of, of, of being a native New Yorker. Me not being a native New Yorker, I felt like I, I knew, you know, even more so what that is like just from listening to you guys and, and, the, and, your, and your listeners um, together. I don't know what your observations are on that or, or what, but. Yes. <laughs> Bob? <laughs> yes or no, Bob? <laughs> nah, I think, uh, I think uh, you know, the, the, the thing about the 80s, even for college radio, and since I was doing promotions, I was able to hear a lot of cassettes from across the country. A lot of people aspired to use college radio as a sort of stepping stone to commercial radio. And Stretch and I initially had no aspirations of that. We just wanted to do a fun show. So we weren't on, you know, on mic being like, and coming up, and 5 p.m. No, we we got the mega dope blast coming up. <laughs> Wasn't, you know, we, really wouldn't even, we, didn't, we wouldn't even give a track listing of what we had played. It would drive people crazy. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't not even... That, I, <laughs> that happened for about, I, I would say, the first, like, two months, you would actually write down the songs. Yeah, and then after that, I was like, and then, too And bad. then I think <laughs> at one point, you just crumpled up the list, <laughs> threw it, did a hook shot, in, yeah. Right into the garbage and never happened again. So the thing I think that that uh, people it endeared us to people was that we weren't trying to be anybody but ourselves. You know, if stress drooled on the mic. <laughs> <laughs> you think that's bad? <laughs> when, when my <laughs> when my hairline started disappearing, you know. That was okay. You it can't was okay. See it. We were we were like okay to be ourselves and just you know be goofy and nerdy and. I mean, we, when, when we started that, that show, I mean, I was already DJing downtown clubs. You, um, that was really your first sort of, your first step out into the public realm, right, was the radio, Absolutely. Right? Uh -huh. And I mean, the first time that, um, I, that you I turned the mic on, on the first show, <laughs> I'm, I'm DJing, I'm, I'm nervous as hell, because I know that potentially at least 15 people are listening. <laughs> and... Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, getting into it, and then <laughs> Bob turns the fader up. Ah! Turns the mic right back down, and it's like, ah, you just freaked out, remember? I just, well, I mean, you know. You did. It's, um. <laughs> Listen, I, well, no, hold on, I, hold on. What I said, no, what no. I said was, what's up, New York? And I was just so scared, I just brought the mic back down, because it was, it was overwhelming. Like, it's, you're in New York. This is like the hip-hop capital of the world at that point, and I'm a nerd, you know yeah. what I mean? Well, listen, the reason why I wanted Bob to do the radio show with me in the first place, I mean, yes, he, he was at Def Jam. We, we, we had only known each other for, for, I mean, weeks at that point, months maybe, but we were, we, it, it was obvious we were going to be really good friends um, just from like the first, our first, our initial meeting. Um, but for me, one of the reasons why I wanted Bob, can I call you Bob? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted Bob to do the show with me is because I didn't want to be I didn't want to be on the radio talking. I did not want to talk. I just wanted to play the music that I loved and the, and yeah. the idea of me actually talking was like was bananas and and I started talking a little bit. The reason why I eventually became a blabbermouth was because when when Funkmaster Flex and Nine Double M as a as an artist as a group on on uh, Warlock Records when they came up when they had um, I've fallen and I can't get up excuse me my phone's ringing um, and uh, Flex was like and Flex was you know Flex was up in the clubs up in you know uptown in the Bronx and he was like yo your your show is is killing it but yo you're the DJ you you got to talk more people don't know they don't know who you are so um, that's why I became a blabbermouth but. But it took a it took a minute. I, ne I never knew that. Yeah, yeah. it I took a minute that. for me to even be comfortable talking on the radio, and I think that that just goes to show that 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 the the kind of awkwardness of even being on the radio in the first place to to where we came, where where, where we ended up. I mean, it's just sort of a a an authentic kind of honest. This is who we are. Yeah. 
Um, and the whole time we did that show, it was like, I mean, there were no windows. I mean, you know, radio stations, uh, the ones I've seen, don't usually have great views or even any, you, you're just in a room. I mean, totally sealed off. Um, and that's what, uh, that's what the experience was like. It was just us and our friends in a room every Thursday night. And it was like, cheers. <laughs> I mean, if people were listening, cool. We, we didn't need people to be listening, really. I mean, we, we loved the music we played. We had more fun laughing than I think I've, I've ever had anywhere or, else. And, um, and the, the accolades, the feedback from calls, all that was just sort of icing on the cake. I mean. Well, plus you also had like, you know, legitimate, credible artists coming up to the show from Jump. More oh, or yeah, less. yeah, yeah, for sure. You know? And certainly, you know, with, with Bob being at Def Jam, he was already, he had a lot of, a lot of connections in there. And I was, you know, downtown in the club scene a little. The, the reason we met was because um, I was uh, finally, and this was such a big deal, you, you, I mean, you, you, you could relate to this, the idea of getting promos in the 80s from, from, from legitimate hip-hop labels was, I mean, that was like, Christmas every day. Um, so <clears throat> when I was popping down in, in the clubs enough to actually get someone from Def Jam to want to give me promos, that's how I ended up going to Def Jam. And this man was the first person that I saw when I was there. And um, that's how we, we even met. I mean, what was, the, what was Def Jam's office like back then? It was down on. Uh, uh, we were at 652 Broadway between yeah. Bleak and Bond. It was. It was actually. It was odd. I mean, I walked in. There was no receptionist. I kind of walked in. I'm like looking around. This is Def Jam. What's going on around here? <laughs> well, tumbleweed went by. It, it was. It was bizarre. And then. And then I, I went. I stuck my head in the conference room and I saw. I saw this guy, actually putting records in in, uh, in envelopes. And I was like, Yo, is is there a Robert Garcia here? He's like, That's me. <laughs> I was like, All right. <laughs> I need some records. <laughs> Bob, what was your impression of this, of this gentleman upon meeting him first? Whoa. <laughs> More, he's going to talk about hair probably. I had a lot of interesting haircuts. I got an interesting haircut right now. Yeah. <laughs> Listen. Last week I saw this guy. I saw. Yo, it's my I saw, turn to talk. Hold on, hold on. See, I saw this guy. I, let's I, go back to nineteen. One second. One second. One second. Oh, man. oh yeah, yeah. Underarms all wet. <laughs> oh, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> We're on Red Bull TV right now. Listen. Stop. <laughs> We're not in a room this with no windows. Wanted, this is what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> what? At, at our friend's birthday party. We, we, we were not going to go there. All right. You want to snap on me? Nah. That's how it's going to be? I saw, I we saw, see each other twice I a year. He wants to snap on I me. No, no, no. I'm not going to say nothing about your Thank head. Thank you. I saw a stretch before I knew him anything. I went to Mars, and he was in a basement. <clears throat> I'll be back. <laughs> nah. Mars is a club in New York, by the way. In 1980. Great club. Not playing Great Amazing club. club. Amazing club. And I remember, literally, when I walked in, he played G-Rap as I walked in. And I was a huge G-Rap fan. So I immediately was like, I don't know who this kid is, but he's nasty. And he was the rest of the night, he played Ultra Magnetic. And just on and on and on and on and on and on. Dope on Plastic, off of Tommy Boy. What was the name of that group? Yeah, Uptown, Dope on Uptown. Uptown, Uptown, yes. You know, he's just playing joints. So that's, uh, that was my first impression of him. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Stretch was... I, I thought he was going to say something else. <laughs> it was very complimentary, actually. It was very complimentary. Yeah, it so. was. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, Stretch was <laughs> holding it down downtown at the parties for, for those who were not yep. there at the time. I remember going to see um, a Stetsasonic show on the Lower East Side. Wow. At the, um, at the, the Rap at Arts Center. Rap Arts Center. At and, Quando um, or... On Third Street. Yes, on that was, Third Street. Was, I don't think Stet actually performed. That was mm -hmm. Prince Paul and I were DJing, I think. Um, Maybe they no, were. No, they did perform, but it was funny because I went, into the, I went into the venue and there was nobody there. It was real early. And I'm, it had a balcony area and I walked upstairs just to look around the room. And there's nobody in the entire place. And except sitting in the bleachers upstairs in the balcony was De La Soul. Just looking bored out of their mind. <laughs> Eventually filled up, but you were playing dance hall early, and I always remember that night because it filled up obviously and it was rocking. But Stretch played a blend of 
It's Foster Silver's misdemeanor with uh, special ed, think about it, instrumental underneath. So, um, you know, <laughs> anyways, that's my, own, that's my own personal memory of a, yeah, I'm a nerd too, in case you didn't know. Um, Prehistoric mashup. This was all pre, pre, <laughs> this is all pre, there were no turntables. This, this is pre it was pre, everything. Pre, yeah, it was. <laughs> no turntables. I had Foster Silvers over here. <laughs> Especially Special I was, was on the mic over here. Um, when did you guys realize that the show was actually starting to take off? You said you, you, you're isolated in this room. Yeah. You're I, only I'll, there with your friends. When did you start to get the feedback to realize it was that. something special? Um, well, Stretch, you know, initially, like he said, it, his main thing was to, to play records. And my thing was to try to produce the show as best possible, you know. And um, I would answer phones. You know, I would give out the, the address on the air. I would read the letters. I would read the letters on air. And, um, and the letters really were the thing, I think, that, that, that validated us super quickly. Because, um, you know, at first, like, I didn't know if I had a right. I didn't know if I was justified to represent hip-hop on radio in New York. <laughs> and that's part of the reason why I was nervous the first show. Because there's a quality and there's sort of like, uh, I mean, it's New York. It's a history, yeah, right? There's, exactly. a, there's a pantheon like, of great... Exactly. So, yeah. But, uh, you know, our first audience was the incarcerated population of the tri-state area. So within the second show, we were getting letters from... Right, I mean, all of a sudden, I knew, and I had never involved myself in crime or been, been to prison, but I knew every single... Holding except, except in the movies. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we got all these letters from people that would say, yo, you're making my bid easier because I have something to look forward to every Thursday night. And these are like dudes from Rawway Prison, life, life sentences. And I would read their shout outs. And all of a sudden their friends and their families could have a, a, a dialogue with peop their people inside. And so they were our first like advocates who would write home and be like, yo, y'all got to check out these people on Thursday nights, 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. And then as they would get out, then, I mean, you know, we had uh, immediately security guards, cab drivers, all the late night. We went from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. on Thursday night. It was like not the ideal time slot to make a world-renowned show. So we were like the, the against the odds type of crew. But um, it was really early on. And then like the first three months, we had Lati, Search, um, Def Jeff, uh, Busta Rhymes, Jungle Brothers, Curious, Third Jungle Days. Brothers, AJ Demain, Bones Malone. So within three months, Law Professor wrote his rhyme for Live at the Barbecue in our studio. It's, I actually have, I have video footage of him mm. doing live at the barbecue on our show, reading the rhymes off the paper. So It's not on YouTube. Don't even bother looking. You will not find it. <laughs> so basically, it. you know, within three months, it was no longer like stretching me calling up cats like, yo, you want to come to a show? We're doing something really cool. At that point, within three months, it was like, now everybody is hitting us up. Everybody that you could imagine from unsigned to indie to major is hitting us up to be on our show within three months. It was New York. We had 10,000 watts. We had listeners in Delaware, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Connecticut New York, and New Jersey. We were quint quintuples. <laughs> we were a choir state. <laughs> We had, we had a lot of listeners. Yeah, a lot of listeners. A lot of listeners. Now, initially, though, you guys split the weeks, right? It was, it was your show on one Thursday and then another yeah, show. Yeah, I was, I was the student. I was actually, you know, this guy was working at Def Jam full time. I was a student at Columbia. and I went to college, too. He did. He went to Wesleyan. Very prestigious. Hard to get into and expensive. <laughs> like uh, no. Um, all right. Um, I, think about it. All right. 
All right. So I was a student at Columbia. Um, I was, you know, the first thing I did even before before uh, I started, I went to the station in the summertime, and someone um, answered the door, and and I think before I could even finish the phrase hip hop, like the door was slammed in my face. There was just they were just not trying to have it. And then um, wait, the reason why was that Pete Knights from third base in '87 was a Columbia student, and he had the first hip hop show on that station. A lot of people don't know that. His DJs were Clark Kent and Daddy Rich. Imagine that. And they got kicked off the air for being uh, um, uh, accused of stealing equipment from the studio. So that's why they weren't kind to hip hop in 90 when Stretch comes Which along. Which makes no sense because the equipment that KCR had when we got on the air was like from 1963. Yeah. Seriously. It had the VU meters and stereo. But one side would always would always fail, and so we, we literally had to use the percussive mes method, which was to actually punch the board, so both sides. And remember the dust that would come out of that <laughs> big, big dust ball. Seriously, this is for real. So anyway, um, and then uh, once once the uh, the semester started, I got word from a friend of mine who was who had a jazz show. He said, "Oh, yo, a Adrian, I wasn't even I was not even stretch at the time." He said, "Yo, there's a, there's a hip hop show." Thinking I'd be I'd be happy about that, and I was like, "What?" Hold on, I was first in line, so I went back to the station, pleaded my case, and got us on the air. And we were on, we were we were alternating with another show, and then that other show, they they lost their chance to be on the radio by I think being um, intoxicated on the air, yeah. and um, we benefited from their foolishness. And um, yeah, and then we were we hit the ground. I was every we were every week, you know, I would say starting probably November, like November eighth yeah. of nineteen ninety. It's funny because the footage that you, ref you referenced a little while ago, there's, there's another uh, clip from that same night on YouTube. Unfortunately, I wasn't in depth aware with all to think about showing it here. But um, I think there is a clip from that night because um, I, I think you had said on Twitter or something like that that yeah, you should have seen the footage of Large Professor. Um, but the, I know Claw and some other people are up there, some friends of yours. You know, so it's, it's, it's pretty bugged out, though, to see you guys just from the early days just, 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 just doing it then. I wonder if you could also speak a little bit about um, as far as the role of the show and you guys in, um, you know, not only breaking these acts, but um, really this community. I mean, I, people don't necessarily realize that between you guys the friends and people you knew who were at labels, the Source Magazine and Matt and um, Matty C. A lot of this was, a, a, you know, this was a, a sort of a, a, um, a platform for a lot of this music to get out there. You know, you could read about it in the magazine, but then you could also get it, hear it on your show. Um, a lot of p important people became a and became, you know, the foundation for 90s hip hop in New York, you know, through this circle that you guys were a, a part of. And I don't know if people really realize that, that this is also intrinsically linked, you know? Um, it's just another reason why the show is so important. And go ahead and speak on that with either a yes or no answer or possibly more. <laughs> no. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> That's a deep question. Well, I, I, I think we should sort of state that uh, some of the artists that we were instrumental in helping out at, when they were unsigned would be like a sort of roll call of the most seminal artists that changed the face of the industry for the 90s and beyond. That would include Jay-Z, <clears throat> who came up when he had a 12-inch deal, no album deal. Nas is an unsigned rapper, Nas. Unsigned, coming up by himself from Queensbridge in the middle of the night as a 16 or 17 year old. And I swear he came up once in, uh, I mean, he was wearing shorts. No, the, his first time up was in February. Okay, the second time. I, uh, shorts. <laughs> Who um, wears shorts going to a, a hip hop show? Biggie Smalls, uh, who thanks to Maddie C, who, was, who wrote the unsigned hype column at The Source, was funneling uh, his artists that he was finding out about to us so the first time anyone had heard Biggie Smalls outside of Fort Greene, Best Eye, was on our radio show. Um, Wu-Tang, uh, Big Pun, when he was Big Dog the Punisher, 
Uh, another Fat, Fat Joe, for that matter. I mean, mm -hmm. Fat Joe. Uh, Maddie C was also uh, brought us up a group called Poetical Prophets. They later became Mob Deep. Um, Big L. Uh, Big L brought up his Eight Is Enough crew, mm -hmm. which included uh, Killer Cam. Later became Cameron. Murder Mace, who later became Mace. Um, and then uh, Simply Two Positive MCs, who later became known as Organized Confusion, who later broke up and Farrell March and uh, Prince. I mean, it, you know, there's about 30 artists, 35 yeah. artists. We also helped re reignite some careers as well. Craig G, uh, Cool Keith, who, you know, those are both like sort of pillars of the indie community. First, first ultra. And then, and then there's a whole there's a whole indie indie like the super indie community of Company Flow and Juggernauts and all those cats uh, that you know really stamped uh, a movement from '95 on. So yeah, they, those were the, the artists that came up to our show, and, and we were we you know it was funny because like we were blessed. We didn't know any of them were gonna blow up the way they did, and when they did, people would look back at our show and be like, oh snap! Like what's what are they go who's gonna come through their show next? And it brought a lot more attention to us as those artists started to, to get big. I think also to further answer you know, your, your previous question about um, at what point did we get a sense that this show was really sort of, sort of meant something. Um, you know, all the artists that you just mentioned were, for the most part, um, 90s, 90s artists. And you know, I think it's safe to say that if you were a, an artist in the 90s from the New York tri-state area, you came through our show, um, you know. But Das Effects, but what was, what Red was, Man, what was, Fuji's. What was incredible for me was to have the legends of the '80s want to come through our show. I mean, that was that was a big deal, and and I would say that that probably the only the only artists that did not come through, and they didn't need to, um, were LL. Um, did Rock him come through? Rock him never came through. Rock him. Um, I mean, it's very few though. And when Cannabis and LL had the beef, Wyclef, one of his contentions with L was that he never came to me and Stretch's show. That's right. That's, that was like yes. you're whack. You didn't go to Stretch's wow. Bobito. Like, how did Wyclef know that? <laughs> like, but, <laughs> but I mean, G, G Rap. He, did he was he, G Rap was was. I mean, we had some legendary nights with G Rap that. I mean, the first time that G came up, I mean, you can imagine if you know G's record, you could probably, records and, and I mean, just not just the... the we were scared. The legendary <laughs> status of, of, of his records, but, but his persona on the records. Yeah, he's an intimidating we guy. Shook. But, I mean, he left it. I mean, he came by, at, at, I mean, he must have come by, at, you know, like 1.30. He didn't leave till like 4.30 in the morning. And then, and then called up the show when he got home. And we proceeded to snap on each other on the phone. And I'm thinking, can I, can I, can I, is this all right? Can I snap on G-Rap? Yeah, it was crazy. On, we snapped on his mom's like five minutes on, on air, like into being on air. And it was like. He loved it. Yeah. Loved like, it. I think no one ever spoke to him like that. <laughs> like, this is really refreshing. You know who G-Rap is? Like, listen to his, yeah. go back and listen to Wanted Dead or Alive. Like, <laughs> he's just. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know who else used to call up our radio show too? God bless the dead, old dirty bastard. Um, when he was ace on unique and unsigned, used to call up our show from Staten Island and freestyle, and would be jubilant that he would be on me and Stretch's radio show again. It was like kind of like this. Uh, That's because you guys it was like the stamp. You guys give a real hard time to most people who <laughs> call him. <laughs> you guys gave a real hard time to most people who called up to try to freestyle though. Yeah, they loved it though. It, it was uh, a bunch, bunch of masochists. It, yeah, they really were. They, I, I mean, mean, it was <laughs> fascinating as a listener to listen to everybody <laughs> repeatedly call to try to come at you guys and Sear, Lord Sear also, who became Absolutely. a big part of the show. He's a huge part of the show. Just get, <laughs> just get destroyed. People will call up and, and talk to us, and we'd be like, all right, yo, cool, peace. And they would stop and get quiet and be like, that's it? Like, yeah, man, peace. And like, you're not gonna snap on me? <laughs> Your big hot dog face, like, <laughs> first thing. <laughs> and then we would cook them, you know, but people would, like, they wanted to get hung up on. We, we, it was the weirdest thing. It was like, 
It's a whole community of like masochists. <laughs> who were some of the regular masochists who would call up? Did you did you know them by name or? Oh, we knew all of them by name. Oh yeah. Yeah, we yeah. had Paula Aponte. We used to call her Paula Apontes. <laughs> Anna <laughs> from Wausau. Anna from Wausau, Queens. Yo, what's up? This is Anna. Anna from Wausau. Yo, we and they call up every week. Yo, Bishop Lord. <laughs> Those are the two women that listen to the show. No, by Madam the way. Superior. And Madam Superior, yeah. three. And then I was answering, <laughs> I was answering the phone, so you know people started trusting us. Like you don't even know this dude shot somebody one night, and called me up. Yo, what do I do? <laughs> like, what you, this is the suicide hotline. Like, right. Call up four one one. I don't know. <laughs> I've never like, shot anybody. Like write a rhyme. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it was really bizarre. You know, when you talk about that community aspect with the show, um, it was it was some serious. There was a dude named Devious that would call up. This guy would call up. I'm telling you, week, for yo. five years, every week he would call up, and when you Annoying, answer the phone, yo. he makes animal sounds, donkeys. <laughs> Mostly donkeys, right? And he got Mostly. my home number at one point, and I changed my home number, yo. <laughs> my home number used to be 982-SUCK. <laughs> Deadass, 7825, look it up. <laughs> and I had to change my shit when DBS found my home number. But, yeah, there was a lot of characters, man. Bolo Brown, he used to call up, <laughs> and then we started calling him Bolo Brown shit. <laughs> And it was um, treasure. <laughs> treasure. <laughs> Woo. Yeah, we're going to leave treasure alone. How about Big Graveyard? Big Graveyard. Yeah, he was Lord locked C. up. Had a, had a crush Brigade, on treasure. Big, Big Graveyard was locked up. He said, yo, when I get out, <laughs> you, need, you need any help? Back up. I got you. Oh, boy. Yep. He's still in, though. <laughs> He gonna see this video now. <laughs> He's like, oh, right. fuck you up, Stretch. <laughs> well, you know, you're big, call, yeah. big graveyard peace. <laughs> Love you. Shout out. Love big you, graveyard. brother. Word. Raw way. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I still got all the letters that we ever got. I saved them. I got them in a... Um, a lot of artwork. People would do artwork. Yeah, yeah. People used to write us. Nice you know. landscapes. <laughs> Did that's, any, a whole, that's a whole nother... Did nother anybody side. who called up and got, a, and got abused, did anybody from that crew ever actually no, come? Yes. That you're going to go bad? Well, they didn't necessarily get abused. Jojo Pellegrino was a caller. Okay. Um, Tame One. Tame One and L, the artifacts. Sensei Artifacts, they were callers. They won sure. a freestyle contest that we did over the phone. We invited them up to the show. They wound up getting signed to Big Beat, become an unsigned hype at, at the source. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of ugly stuff that happened back then, too, though. You know, people will call up and uh, give us uh, death threats. Uh, there were a couple of times when artists waited for us outside the studio at 5 a.m. <laughs> so, hey, what happened? <laughs> and, play, and play shot put with my record crates. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable oh, what, what adrenaline can do. I wasn't do, there. I wasn't what, there. What adrenaline can do at 5 a.m. <laughs> based on what, though? Why? Just for snap session or something nah, else? Nah, nah, never, never for just snaps. It was more like... It was usually it was not, not being abla allowed in the premises without being invited. I uh, mean, you know, it was, yeah. listen, we didn't, have, we didn't have a staff. It was, it was you know, You're looking me, at I was hustling, I was hustling <laughs> from, from Thursday to Thursday, getting, I mean, at one point, just cassettes and test pressings and then dats. You know, Bob and I were both arranging guests. Um, during the show, I was literally DJing and this guy was answering the door, answering the phone, co-hosting, making sure no one was violating. And I mean, there was plenty, plenty of violating going on. I mean, you know, blunts, gun. It sounds like a, a, the, the title of a hip hop record, right? G blunts, guns, and graffiti. Or no? Yeah, there were some people that violated the station. You know, well, that's just you know, we didn't let the them in. Yeah. They wanted to get their demo play. Yeah. Wu Tang, the first time they came up. Stretch wasn't there. I was there by myself. I didn't have an FCC license. I wasn't supposed to be on the radio alone. And five dudes. I'm sure, I know it was RZA, because I recognized him. He had came up when he was Prince Rakeem. But it was him, I remember Ghost, and three other dudes. And Ghostface was the one that was acting like 
crazy, like, yo, money, play well, our joint, play and, our joint. And Mimi Valdez, a, a dear that friend was a, of that ours. Was another, that was another night. Oh, okay. That was another night. They, <laughs> Wu -Tang is they cursed on Mimi Valdez, who wanted to become the editor in chief of Vibe. She was a homegirl. She used to help us answer the door. They apologized. Method Man apologized yeah. on, on, on air, though. But yeah, there's a lot of ugly moments. Shout out to Wu Tang. <laughs> <laughs> yo, did you see Method we Man in Red Tail? He was, nah. yo, that was, y'all seen Red Tail? Red Tail? Method Man is in Red Tail. Yo, go see that, man. <laughs> Wu Tang, Wu Tang. <laughs> so we were the first people to play the Wu Tang Protect Your Neck record when it was a white label, and it didn't even have an inscription on what it was. So I played it. Stretch wasn't there, and his boy Eli Morgan Gessner. Anybody know who that is? Zoo York founder, skateboarder legend. Calls up. He's like, Yo, Bob, what was that record with the with the karate shit in the beginning? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I gave it to Stretch, and then the rest is history. They became a powerful, powerful force in the night. Still, still, still are. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, Ra Raekwon came down to the the twentieth reunion that we had um, yes. in New York City last year, and um, I mean, it was you know, if if any of you have had the the joy of uh, working in the hip hop industry and working with artists, you know that um, sometimes it takes a few phone calls and reinforcements <laughs> and then you still don't know if someone's gonna show up or on time or at all. And I tell you, Raekwon, he, was, he showed up, he said, I told you I'd be here, and he just destroyed that party. He made, he made well, a lot of people made that night, but he, but he particularly like, yeah, it was, took it was it to another level. Phenomenal. Yeah. Shout out to Raekwon, shout out to Wu-Tang. Yes, indeed. Wu-Tang, Wu-Tang, Wu-Tang. <laughs> Should we, uh, why don't, we, why don't we play a little something just to give people, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that a lot of people know the, the show, but, um, yeah, yeah, sure. so um, this gives you a little idea of the, 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 the way the show was, was going down back in the day. Yeah, yeah. That Jay-Z guy, is, he's not bad, huh? <laughs> you know, it's funny though, I mean, just, I mean, but seriously, it's like, I'm sure, like, this is February 23rd, 1995, this is recorded, and I'm sure at the time it was like, yo, Big L ripped it. The Jay-Z guy was cool too, you know? And <laughs> here we are in, you know, 2012, and I mean, Jay-Z is Jay-Z. It's it's funny how the perspective at the time, you know how they say in professional sports, the difference between a good team and a championship team may only be just a few different breaks. I mean, I feel in some respects that was kind of the level of the talent pool, you know, at the time in New York in the 90s with a lot of these artists. It really was a very uh, strong pool, you know? Um, your thoughts, gentlemen, yes or no? <laughs> um, the interesting thing for, for me personally, I, I don't want to speak for both of us on this, is that I sort of remember that night <laughs> in, the, in the ledger of great nights in my mind that doesn't even register like I mean, to me, like, there were some phenomenal live performances in our studio that I'll never forget, like, to the, I can remember what I was wearing, what Stretch was wearing, like, everything, like, what time people showed up. That night is kind of vague to me, not to, not to take anything away from, me, from it, but I think that probably, of, of, of anything else, kind of lives on in everyone's mind as, like, the moment that people identify me and Stretch's radio show. And, you know, God bless Big L, man. Real, real nice, real nice, I, let's say nice kid, because he was really that. He was a humble young brother from Harlem. You bumped into him in the street. He really had much to say. He was quiet. You would never expect that listening to his rhymes. He respected the hell out of me and Stretch. Came up to our show like four or five times. And really, that was a great freestyle, but his other visits were more memorable in my mind than, than that one. 
Um, not to take anything away from, from the rhyme, but the beat that Stretch played was cool. It wasn't like my favorite instrumental, personally. I think it just it works now because of who Jay Z is and, and right exactly I mean, the time. It's like you know it's 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 aged. Yeah, Big L passes away. Jay Z becomes this multi platinum artist, and then now people look back look back at that and like wow. And Milkbone is just. <laughs> <laughs> He's the dude that did the instrumental. About to come out with a new record. <laughs> Available on Mega Upload. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out Milkbone. Peace to Milk recorded. Bone, yeah. <laughs> Nick the Wiz did that beat though, and, and he's a he's an unsung, an T-neck, unsung. New Jersey, right? Un, uh, I don't know that yeah. far down, in, but New Jersey, yeah, New, New Jersey, Jersey. An, an unsung, um, you know, producer from the '90s who was, I thought, a really sensational. Was that Keep It Real? Was that the name of the track? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah it doesn't get Shit. any more '90s than that. Yeah. Um, now I used to say that all the time. Keep it real, Bob and I. Yeah, of course. That was our, that was our catchphrase. Eighty-nine point nine. Stretch Armstrong, Bobito. Keep it real. <laughs> no. <laughs> that, that, no, that's a joke. It didn't happen. So, so, <laughs> what stands out then? Each of you, your personal favorite, I guess, or the most memorable experience. Which is which is the one that. For if me, this is the one for a lot of the fans who pass around the, the, the MP3 online. For what's, me, what's yours? For me, there's no one, but um, when Prince Poe and Monge came up and we lost, we lost power at the station in the middle of them ripping it, that was kind of some, some sort of supernatural, this is too much. And then the, the station went back on and we continued. Um, when, uh, when Large Professor brought his SP up and he was there with KRS-One, that was... Ridiculous. Uh, Lord, Lord Finesse, Lord Finesse yeah. brought up the SP for KRS. Large brought up the SP for um, Farrell Monch, yeah. Large Professor, Cool Keith, and OC. Yep. Boy, how you be? Yeah. I do it like this. I pass it to you. Um, Nas, Nas came up one night, and um, and I had just made a beat um, with a Bobby Hutchinson loop with uh, the Lonnie Liston Smith drive drums. It wasn't even mixed, I was, I played the drums, I sort of triggered the drums live, it really wasn't, it was on a dat though, and, and I was curious to see, I mean, here, you know, this was still early in Nas's career, but he was that dude already. You, you knew he was going to be, the, the Illmatic hadn't came out yet. But he was, you know, it was, we already, I mean, let's. The let's, most anticipated album of the 90s by far. We can't front. Unequivocally. Like, before, bef just off of Live at the Barbecue, we kind of revered Nas, and um, and I had a chance to um, to get to know him outside of the station because um, Rob Reef Tulo and I, through Akinelli, were trying to get him. And I know you were you as well. Both of us were trying to were trying to get Nas placed at a label, and um, uh, and I think for me, one of the you know me being so young and just sort of revering the whole the whole you know milieu, <laughs> if you will. Um, Nas, I was like, this dude has was was a, was wait, a wait, guest. Time out, time out. Shout out Wu Tang right now. <laughs> 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 shout out Wu Tang for <laughs> for using that word. <laughs> nah, shout out to uh, Cool Keith, Agamonious. You know what Agamonious means? <laughs> nah, little hamburgers. <clears throat> um, anyway, Nas off of one appearance on a record was 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 already like this kind of like like semi deity to me and it was really hard for me to deal with him on a business level because I was doing A and R for Big Beat, but it was like, you know, this is when when, you know, record label people were just getting slayed. You know, no one could trust a an A and R person. You know, you know, Tribe Called Quest were making were were had records about, you know, record people being shady. And here I was, you know, in that position. So I was trying to get Nas to to like, you know, like and trust us. Meanwhile, he was getting signed under our nose because other people were, were making moves a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. But um, so Nas is up on the radio station for the second time, right? Third. And for the third, third time, and I'm, and I'm thinking, I should play him this track that I just made because I'm kind of feeling it. Let's see, what do you think? So I didn't, I didn't tell him it was mine, but I put, I put the headphones on. I said, tell me if you're feeling this. And he was like, oh, his head was bobbing. Yeah, let's do it. And, and he spit um, the rhymes to represent as well as uh, some other rhymes over, over this beat that I made. And that was, and, and, yeah, you know, memory lane rhyme. I, never, I never became, you know, uh, you know I, I, 
I dallied in, in production, but I, that was yeah. never really my thing. But it was, it was for me, like a, as a fan, was a pretty big deal. Let me see if we have to hear Nas spit over a beat I made. Let me see if this is it. Indeed. So. All right, we, we're going to take questions in a minute. I just want to ask you just quickly about the end of the show. You know, guys decided to uh, move on to other things. And you know what may what folks may or may not know is you oh, were always into other things as well. You know this was one component that people knew you, or one thing that people knew about you. But um, these other things, obviously, these other interests have manifested themselves in everything you've done since. But what happened at the end of the show? Why'd you call it quits? Well, before before I called it quits, we <laughs> we we amicably agreed to alternate week to week. And um, as a joke, um, I, the, the Thursday I was doing became Thug Thursdays. <laughs> <laughs> I'd play like machine gun sounds. <laughs> you know, sort of poking fun at where, where everything was going, but also, you know, the, the tone of my show, of, of the show that I was doing on Thursdays was, was a lot different from Bob's. And it was, um, I think, really, more than anything, a reflection of how, how hip-hop had grown and just splintered off into so many different directions. When, when we started the show in 90, there was no question what was dope and what was whack, and that was that. And as the years went on, Bob's taste developed and went a certain way, and, and mine went a certain way. And it got to the point where there was a little bit of, uh, I mean, we just wanted the show to go different directions. And, um, and I think more than, anything, more than anything, we wanted to remain friends rather than start to you know, let a professional thing get in the way of that. So, um, and at the time, we were doing Hot 97 together. And I think, I think for me, as a DJ on that sort of commercial mainstream platform, I really wanted the show to sound kind of slick. And I had, I would say, mixed, mixed feelings about it. But I think a part of me had ambitions about having that show grow into something into something else and not just be that in and, its, in and of itself. Um, but a lot of, a lot of, the, of, the, of the sentiment and, uh, and kind of vibe of, of the KCR show, we certainly brought up there. But after a while, it was like I was trying to do one thing and Bob was trying to do another thing. And I think we, we even, I can't speak for you, but it was like we were almost sort of, you know, unbeknownst to the public, like, jabbing each other in the, in the ribs a little bit here and there. Like, he, Bob would take his shtick, like, even way over the top, and I would get, like, extra grimy, play, like, the most thugged out, violent music I could find, knowing that Bob would hate it. <laughs> so, so we were at, we were, <laughs> we were at, um, at, at Hot 97, and I don't remember how it happened, but we, you know, he walked into the booth, and, and one of us was like, yo, we just got to, and we broke the ice, and and I think we walked out of there relieved, knowing that our friendship would be intact. And we agreed to do KCR every other night. And I think Bob was like, "You could have, <laughs> you could have Hot 97. I don't even want to do this." <laughs> and that was, um, and then I did, I did uh, KCR for you know I don't even know how much longer I did it, alternating with you. And then I just got kind of um, I didn't see the point of doing it any, anymore. It was uh, it was really. Um, it took a lot to do a show that was all the way uptown, yeah. four hours from one in the morning to five in the morning, and um, even doing it every other week, I was just I was exhausted from doing it, and I really found that I, I, I by 1998 I couldn't even find you know enough music to fill four hours. I just couldn't do it. I mean, I would have to play either old music, which I didn't want to do because I was always about playing the newest and and most you know cutting edge stuff. Um, or I'd have to play stuff I didn't like, and I, I, I'll never, ever, you know, past, present, future, play, play music I don't like. It's just not going to happen. So I called it quits on Thursday, and I, I continued to do Hot for, I think, a number of years, until about 2001. Yeah, I, I did a radio show uh, with Lord Sear, who's now on Shady FM, Sirius Satellite. We renamed it. But Sear would, Sear would be there every Thursday. Yeah, He'd no be matter. there with me and, and Bob. Yeah, because he just had no... He was the bridge. <laughs> But uh, I did it until 2002. We rebranded it, uh, the CM Family and Radio Program. And, um, and I left in 2002, similar to Stretch, 
I just I felt it was becoming difficult to do a four hour show on a volunteer basis when I only liked when I only loved maybe five records that I was playing in that four hours. So me and Sarah would be creative and take a lot of phone calls. But it was also indicative of, of the time, you know, like uh, there's a lot of problems. I mean, we can go deep into this with the accessibility of hip hop in, in the last 10, 12 years and how it negatively affected the quality of it uh, with the internet and with the increase in, of equipment and the mentorship being gone and the, you know, Stretch and I were looked at as kind of like this, uh, this funnel we would take all this hip hop and then funnel it every Thursday to the, to the very best of what you could hear. But once it became easy to just download and listen to, anyway, that's a little long story. But I, I am f infinitely thankful to this brother for inviting me to, to host the show and infinitely thankful for the community that, that listened because I used the 12 years I was on the radio as a platform to get so much other work in di completely diverse networks that you would not ever think. But I've walked into meetings and, and people would be like, yo, I used to listen to you and Stretch. Word, oh, yo, good looking. And, and that would help with writing, that would help with films, that would help with, with entrepreneurial. I opened up a store, I had a record label, I'm working on a film right now. Like, you know, it, it's, it's amazing how, how that position of the 90s has um, trickled to so many other facets of my life, even though like, if you hear me play now, you, you'll rarely hear me play a rap record, period, in my set, and that's been like that for like 12 years, even when I was on radio. So it, it's disappointing for some people when they come hear me spin, because they still think that I'm Bobito 1995, which is fine, you know, that's, that's fine, but, um, but yeah, to me, it was just a, a, a pure positive experience. Well, I think also, you know, just from what you guys have said up to this point, it was a commitment, it was a choice, it was a decision to get into hip hop and support it at that time. And if it wasn't, enthusiasm's not there, then there really is no point in going on. Well, I'd say initially it wasn't a commitment, it was a, it was a impulsive obsession. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and staying up to 5 a.m. every week was not, not with my headline. We, in the early hard. 90s, we would do that, we would do that show and then go downtown and go to breakfast and talk yeah. about the show. Yeah. I mean, we. I mean, you know, I can't stay up past 11:30 unless I'm getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> now, for real. But I do want to mention also everything that the stuff you guys are doing right now. Um, plant. Do you yeah, I've got to. You know, um, you know, you you kind of said it well. You know, even parallel to the radio show, um, I was a club DJ, and since the mid '80s, I've been a you know an avid collector fan and DJ of um, sort of any music that I like. Um, and in 2001, when I stopped doing the radio, I was like, I gotta just step back from, from this hip hop thing and, and just open my ears and, and really honestly just go with what, go where, where I'm feeling it. And I got back into electronic dance music, house music, whatever you wanna call it. Um, and that's what, plant is um it's uh you know and even that's just one facet of of my tastes um i've you know i've i'm a rabid collector of of all kinds of music um and it's uh it's great to have uh that kind of experience and knowledge of different kinds of music but it's also it's also challenging because it's confusing sometimes to to listeners and fans, it's confusing to myself sometimes, you know, because like I said, like, I mean, I don't know, tomorrow I might just not be into something and then I gotta go over here. But that's just because I, I treat it like sort of in an, in an honest and uh, I can't do it any other way, you know? Yeah, yeah. And Bob, of course, besides um, your label, um, Alala, yes, correct? Um, one of several labels that you've done, um, uh, releasing exclusively seven inches of all different cross the board styles, um, all the street ball stuff, uh, authoring books, TV personality, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, I've, I've been blessed to do a lot in my life. Um, but right now, I'm uh, co-directing a film. Well, actually, I've co-directed a film. It's called Doing It in the Park, Pick Up Basketball. 
NYC. Uh, we actually met with Franz Cayo, who I heard is no longer with Red Bull Media House, but they were interested in acquiring it. So I might very well be part of your family very soon. <laughs> uh, we'll see what happens with that. But um, the film, we submitted to Tribeca Film Festival, and um, we're looking to have it out this summer. So that's my, yeah, good looking. Yeah. And the, the music in the film, as you would might, might imagine, is bananas. Yeah. It's bananas. Yeah. But I think it's just, you know, that stuff to me is so relatable as well. If I think for anybody who came up in this generation from the 90s was passionate about hip hop, I mean, you get older, you, your, your interests diversify, and that's just uh, sort of the cycle of life. Do we have any questions for these gentlemen before we get out of here? Hello. Please wait for the microphone. Where are Over you? Over here. Uh oh, Karma got un a question. Un uh, unknown hip hop fanatic here in the corner. But where? Oh, oh, oh. Josh. Oh, wait. Unknown, Hi, Josh. Unknown hip hop fanatic. So, being that we are on the opposite side of the country, can you talk about the influence of West Coast hip hop in the 90s uh, and how that creeped its way into your show uh, as well? And that's not a 20 minute question, that's the short version, I guess. I would say the hip hop from the West side that, um, that I played um, really didn't have an influence on the show. I would say, if anything, the hip hop that we championed from the West Coast was influenced by New York, and that's why it sounded right to us. And, but we played a lot. I mean, Freestyle Fellowship, um, uh, you know, Far Side, Chronic. I was the first person in New York City to play. Yep. Yep. To play Snoop. Um, I mean, even, even you know, they're first not, it's not Cali, but Ghetto Boys. Ghetto Boys. I mean, I they sent me a, a plaque and out of out of nowhere, rap a lot. I was like, what's? And they acknowledged that I was, you know, for for a long time, I was uh, my show, our show was the only place you could hear mine playing tricks on me. So. Yeah. Um, I remember, uh, you know, we were cool with. Dante Ross, and um, he gave us a demo for Taxi by Souls of Mischief. If no, anybody, that's not how it went. Though. Huh? No. Oh, Don wait, wait. All right, but let me just finish my point. But basically, the High Road crew was coming up to our show, and they hadn't even splashed the Bay Area radio network yet. And by virtue of our tapes being influential, like you know, Sway and Tech were, were our peoples, and they listened to us. Benny B on Calix was our peoples. Kevy Kev at KZSU. I mean, these pillars, Davey D, Davey were D. pillars of Bay Area radio hip hop were all friends of ours. And sometimes they would hear us play stuff and then wind up playing it. And it was interesting that Souls had to come to New York to get a little exposure to, to start getting love in the Bay, they, which they hadn't gotten yet. That's the story that I know. Maybe I'm messing it up. Shush could, could correct me. The story is that... <laughs> Um, we were coming out here to the Gavin convention, and, uh, Gavin, uh, yeah, yeah. and uh, Rob Tulo we and I were doing Gavin. a and for Big Beat, uh -huh. and we knew about, um, through, through Dante, Dante was like, you, you got to check, check my man Domino, who's got this crew. Shout out to Domino. We came out here, and I think within like 15 minutes of, of getting to the hotel for the convention, and we didn't have badges, we were low budget, no badges, nothing. There was one year we won... We won the Gavin Award for Best uh, College Mix Show, and we couldn't even go to the, the awards banquet because we didn't have badges. We were <laughs> low budget. We, we won that two years in a row. We were outside jumping up and down. No, we, we didn't really care, to be honest, but it was cool. Anyway, so within 15 minutes of getting to the, uh, the, um, the hotel, we met, we met Domino and, and Hyrule, and we were in the back of uh, in some stairwell in a, in, in a cipher. Um, and... And, and Rob and I were like, yo, these kids are crazy. And it was casual, extra prolific, who was Snoop at the time. I told him, I was like, yo, Snoop, there's a Snoop from LA who I think is gonna beat you out of your name. Good he call, was like, Stretch. Word. Yeah, yeah, he was like, all right, I got another one, extra prolific. <laughs> what do you know? So, um, so anyway, so we-, we You're getting long-winded. I am, I am. So this other questions. That's how we got down with Hyro, and, and then they came and spent. I just really remember this because it was during the Rodney King riots that Hyro were ah, souls right. were at our. Bob and I lived together with with uh, the film producer and director we, Nick we were Weston. Roommates. We were roommates. We were roommates. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you sound so silly. <laughs> and um and. I'm, <laughs> 
sit back, <laughs> chill out. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so they were they were at our at our at our crib um, during the riots, and it was it was very <laughs> memorable. <laughs> anyway, yeah. they gave me the taxi demo. And Yo Yo was at our show the night of the the Rodney King riots as well. Do you remember that? Yes. And Stretch played "F the Police" by N.W.A. Yeah. One of Stretch's few political statement moments. <laughs> then he went back to Thug Thursdays. <laughs> no, it took it took a few years for that to germinate. <laughs> Wu Tang. Wait, other questions? Any I'm other sorry, questions? that's Jeff is, that's Jeff's <laughs> that's Jeff's um response. Jeff's is, yes, yo, how could the mic the mic gotta get to calm at some point? Just, uh, you good? All right. So one of the most interesting cats. What's in the your world, name? Damon. What's up, brother? Yeah. One of the most interesting cats in, in hip hop right now is 2011 Rebel Music Academy lecturer Doom, aka MF Doom, aka Zev Love X. Oh, he you killed me. He killed me in uh, Rebel Music Academy in Europe, right? Did he? Yeah, he was talking about um, my hairline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, it got back told, to me. That it was a pretty short that, that conversation. Story, <laughs> so here's the chance for, for payback. I wanted to ask if you had any stories from the fondle fondle days when when he came out with the with the doom persona that you guys working together i got nothing but love for doom for real and i i'm forever grateful that he came to me by via curious because we were all crew and when he created the mf doom persona was like yo like i heard you got an independent label you know, I got some demos. We put out Hey and Dead Bent. Eventually, put out Doomsday, that the Operation Doomsday, the, his debut album. And I'm so proud. I'm so proud. He was on a cover of like Rolling Stone or one of the rock magazines. I mean, he's done very well with that second life. You know, and uh, rest in peace, his brother Sub Rock and and um, the whole KMD crew. You know. You guys yeah, I got, nothing but, I got nothing but love but doom, for Doom. Me too. He's, he spent about two weeks um, at my place recording for a lot of the stuff that came out after that. Mm. And yeah, he's, I mean, he was, he rarely slept. I, I mean, the work ethic of Doom and I, that, that I got to witness was, was, was really some, something yeah, to great behold. Dude, great dude. So what happened was um, him and MF Grimm has sent me a... Um, uh, a, a card, <laughs> and I opened it up, and it said the it was like a condolence card. It was like sorry for your loss, and I was like I didn't know what what where it was going with this. I was like, and I opened it up, and it was something like yo, we're sorry you lost you lost your headline. <laughs> uh, you know about that? We weren't living together anymore. <laughs> we broke up. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's doom. All right, who's next? Karma? No. Who? Agamonius. Little hamburgers. Andre representing the T dot. <laughs> like your hat, brother. Nick, I know you got a question too. You got to say something. For real, if you don't turn red. <laughs> okay. Um, so, if, hey, Bob. For Hi. those of you that haven't seen the Tribe documentary, definitely check it out. Have, who's seen the Tribe documentary? Bob's in it. It's very good. I liked it. Yeah. Um, so my question, I was going to ask a question about what you think is positive about hip-hop since, since the 90s, what you think um, has developed in a positive way, but I also want to know who you think is going to win the NBA championship this year post-lockout. <laughs> um, second question is, uh, while I spend so much time playing, I'm, I'm not the fan that people would expect me to be. I'm actually not that much of a spectator. Um, I really couldn't say who's going to win the NBA this year. I wrote for my Puerto Rican players, Carlos Arroyo, JJ Barea, who's now with the, uh, the Wolves, Carmelo Anthony, a lot of people don't know he's Boricua, he's with the Knicks. So whatever teams that they're rocking with, Ronaldo Balkman is also on uh, the national team of uh, Puerto Rico. Whatever teams they on, I'm rooting for them. Uh, but um, as far as the positive stuff that's happened in the last 10 years, I really don't know. You know, I, I play vinyl. I don't own a cell phone. Some people might think I'm antiquated or technophobe. I just, I, I really feel comfortable in the space that I am, and I love who, who I continue to be. So 
a lot of hip hop doesn't come out on vinyl. And for that reason, I don't, I, I just don't, I mean, you know, I might hear about Senor Chaos, he, he might post his video on my, on my public page on Facebook or Blue and Exile, I'll hear people talking about them and I'll hear a joint, I'm like, oh, that's dope or, you know, uh, I mean, whoever, there's, there's a couple of cats out there, I'm not saying like, it's not valid, but, um, and you know, when I think of hip hop, of course, I think of it as a universal movement, not just in the rap form. So I think there's a lot of great things. I mean, you guys did Bouncing Cats, you know, with my boy, my brother, Crazy Legs, you know, him going to Uganda and, and showing uh, kids with amputated arms and, you know, how to break. And, you know, there's so many beautiful things that have come out of the community that, um, that I'm happy about and happy to be a part of. But as far as rap, I can't, I can't really tell you. Word. Cool. Um, I got a question over here. Uh, man, you know, you guys, you know, sort of talk about your, your, your college. Sorry about that. Um, wait, wait, what's your name, brother? Uh, my name is Henry. Peace, man. Peace, peace. Um, yeah, you guys talk about, you know, your college radio days. And, you know, I mean, I, I, got, I got my start in, in college radio as well. And, you know, I, I kind of see what it meant to the music and especially in, we'll talk about 90s hip hop, uh, you know, getting, you know, those envelopes with two copies of the vinyl, you know what I mean, each and every time, and you're like, whoa, you know what I mean, tonight's show is gonna bang. <laughs> Describe what you felt the college radio circuit, and obviously, you know, you guys being right in it, did for the hip hop boom of the 90s, because for me, it was everything. You know, you could, you could hit like almost any town and be like, yo, where's a college radio station? And at some point find a college hip hop show with some real credible dudes who are like doubling up the record. And you're just like, oh, that's how it's supposed to be played. So do you guys want to sort of maybe get into what you felt? You know, obviously we know what your show was like, but just in general, what college radio meant, meant to that movement. I mean, it's just the nature of community and college radio when you're not paying bills. The, you know, the stations are, are basically nonprofit, and they allow um, the people on the air to, to, to do what they want. So if a station is blessed to have uh, you know, people that really are passionate and know what they're doing, then that's what's going to filter through. I mean, it's you know, the polar opposite of commercial radio, which we all know is, is just about unlistenable right now. I mean, you, you got guys on mix shows on commercial radio just mixing the records that you're gonna hear in the daytime. It doesn't really make much sense. Um, so for us, I know it was, uh, you know, when, when fans would, would discover our show, they would know that they would get literally, you know, maybe, you know, minus the talking, three and a half hours, three hours of, of music that back then you could not get anywhere else. There was no internet. You know, these were records that were on cassette, dat, test pressing, and sometimes, you know, you know, if, if, if I couldn't stop playing a record, you know, it would be a record that you could get at Rock and Soul or, or at your local 12 inch shop. So it's just the nature of, uh, of uh, commercial versus, versus uh, community and college radio. What's up? My name is Manny. Thanks for coming out here and What's sharing. What's up? Not much. Um, one question for both of you guys. Uh, where do you uh, like to shop records? Do you guys shop online? You know, I, I heard you mentioning that you only play vinyl. That, that's really badass. And uh, how about you, Stretch? Do you uh, do digital or? <coughs> I, um, I am digital and um, I cannot, the idea of, of having more records enter into my life <laughs> is not something I'm prepared to do. Um, which is sad because, you know, as the years go by, you know, I mean, I, I, sometimes when I do go to a record shop just, just to see stuff, I see stuff that, that used to cost a fortune being affordable now or, or records that, that, I, I never, that weren't even in circulation among dealers in, in the 90s that, that, you know, I do miss it. I mean, I, I used to be nuts. I mean, I'm talking about as early as 1990, I would drive, you know, off with like T. Ray or, or Duke of Denmark. If you don't know who he is, look him up. Incredibly influential DJ from, from Denmark who moved to New York in the 80s. Um, but we would drive up and down the East Coast, just stopping in random cities and towns, going to the, going to the you know, ripping pages out of the, out of the uh, yellow pages in, in a phone booth and just hitting up record spots. And eventually, 
you find, you know, you're talking to people and you end up in some dude's basement, you know, buying records off, off he's like, I haven't played these records since 1973. And, you know, nuts. And I, I've amassed a considerable collection, which right now is in boxes in, in storage. And I'm actually going to take them out of storage because I really miss them. But I don't think I could, I don't think I could buy more. <laughs> um, to answer your question, uh, you know, fortunately for both of us, we, uh, we travel quite often. So, you know, that's an advantage to the, to the DJ that makes a little noise outside of your hometown. So, you know, I, wherever I am in the world, if I have the opportunity, um, I go out and, and, and support the local record shop. Um, here you got rookies, you know, Groove Merchant, on and on. Um, but a lot of the, the a lot of the, I, I actually love, I feel good about my old records. I love buying records that are released in now, like 2012. One of the best stores for that in the world that I know of is Rush Hour. They're out of Amsterdam. And I'm, you know, they send out a weekly update. And, um, you know, I, I want to, you know, spend a lot of money for uh, shipping. But to me, it's like if it's a record that I'm going to play for the next 30, 40 years, then, it, then it's worth it to have it, particularly because when I play it, more than likely only, you know, 300 people in the world have it. And more than likely the, the crowd is, I mean, I'm, I'm like the anti-Shazam app. Because whenever I spin, like people are coming up to me like, yo, the, the song you're playing doesn't register on my phone. The first time somebody did this, I didn't even know what he was talking about. I don't own a phone. So I was like, like, I just didn't know what he was doing. Like, yo, like. He's <laughs> like, <laughs> What's that? <laughs> but um, uh, in New York, definitely Turntable Lab, um, absolutely. Uh, Academy Records, you know, Good Records, A1, Big City. Yeah, you know, those are like, it's like a little circuit that you I, do. I Rest in peace to Fat Beats. Those. I got to say, I, I stopped buying records when, when stores like that started doing all the work for people. Um, and... Uh, you can make whatever you want of that. I just, I really liked going places that no one else was. I mean, there's, I have a, a lot of memories that, you know, you know I, could, I could pick out certain records and I know how I got that record and what it took to get that record. I may not have paid a lot for it, but I had to, you know, do a lot of crazy shit to get to the place to get it. Um, and to me, um, you know, when, when, when it's too easy, it, to me that's, Th that takes away the experience, and I think um, some of you diggers probably know what I'm talking about. But I mean, but even the, like the the shopping experience with new records was different then because it was community based. I mean, you go to Rock and Soul on a Thursday or Friday after everybody gets paid to get their records for the weekend for the parties. You know, everybody's playing stuff. You know, there's one turntable. There's no headphones. Everybody hears it in the store. If they like it, everyone rushes to that part of the store to grab it. So it was a different, I mean, that was part of the fun too. Absolutely. Talking, uh, talking to, you know, listeners about, about music, just yeah. spending, you know, three, four hours. I used to spend literally in, in like 88, 89, I would spend up to four or five hours a day at Downtown Records just listening to all the, this is 89, 80, all the new house imports from Europe. And I mean, I, I'd be behind the turntables playing records for people because I was just there. And it was like it was like I were, I would help people out, and you you would learn so much just by talking to people that you know that that love the music as much as you did, and that's gone now, f for the most part. Who's uh, next? Janet, um, I am probably one of the few people lucky enough to have been working and living in New York when you guys are on the radio. So I don't want to tell how old I am, but that you mentioned Gavin. And that was a time of like impact and Mix Show Summit and Jack the Rapper and BRE. Yes, and um, also labels, labels <laughs> that, that promoted hip hop. Tommy Boy and Rockus and Jive. And what's the one thing that you guys miss about that time? Because it's not coming back. We're not going to see that again. I don't miss anything about it. I, the show, just the show. I don't even Doing miss the, the show. show. No, no, no. I mean, not in a negative way. I feel it's, it's no. I mean, I, I, it's I, precious and it's and it's cherished. But I don't miss. I don't miss it. Listen, I'm not trying to make it happen again. Yeah. But I have, I have. That was the most fun I had in doing the hip hop thing, <laughs> right? <laughs> we, we doing did, the hip hop. We did the hip hop thing. Rap. <laughs> 
rap isn't what is it? What did KRS say? <laughs> <laughs> rap is something you do. <laughs> hip hop is something you live. I did it and I lived it. <laughs> rap and hip hop. <laughs> I didn't rap once. Once I rapped. He's got it on tape. Not good. Not good. That's when we lived Listen, together. <laughs> one of the reasons. One of the. What'd you say? That's when we lived together. <laughs> One of the reasons we, I think we stopped doing the show is because everything in between doing that show was so unenjoyable. I mean, just the hustle took so much energy. And, you know, in 1990, going to Def Jam and getting promos, that was amazing. But then going to Def Jam in 1995 was a pain in the ass because you got to go midtown, you got to get your name tag, they got to call up, you got to go up to the 50th floor, you got to, you know, do three backflips and then sign in. It's just, you know, the, the, the industry became such an industry. And um, that wasn't fun. That's so funny. Out of, out of Guy's question. a dick. <laughs> Love you, man. Yes. Out of quick questions. This uh, Senor Chaos. Senor um, Chaos, represent the ATL. Yes, sir. Um, I lived in New York City when I was younger, so I was fortunate enough to listen to the show as well. And I, I first heard about the show through somebody who was who was older. And uh, as a kid going to school, people would people would trade tapes, and you had somebody that would tape. Uh, you know, the first hour of the show, or somebody else would tape the second hour of the show, and then if you missed the hour, you know, people would people would trade tapes, and uh, that was one thing I didn't uh, hear you guys touch on is just uh, the aspect of how the tapes became legendary. You know, I've even you know gone to record stores around the world, and people have, people sell old um, Stretch and Bob episodes, you know, in in, in different stores, and uh, also fortunate enough to have you know my music played on uh, on CM Fam. Uh, by yourself, which I have on tape from July 18th, <laughs> 2002. Wow. Uh, or whatever. Um, so I just wanted to, to hear you guys touch on that. And I was also always curious as who was there, was there somebody designated to tape the show? And did you guys <laughs> archive all of the shows? <laughs> and then, you know, how many tapes did it take y'all to actually do that? Somebody take the mic from him. He's asking too many that's questions. It, that's it. That's it. <laughs> There's five questions. You want to. Um, I can, I can respond. Yeah, I mean, I, I always made a point of trying to tape, but there was so much preparation that went in. I mean, literally, I was like running around like a, a headless chicken before each show, just getting the records, and just it was chaos. Eventually, I hooked up a, a, a hi-fi VHS to my tuner, which would record eight hours continuous, and I would just start recording when I, le when I, when I left the house, and I would get this great, warm, analog recording of the show, and I would say over the last four years, I've been digitizing every tape I have, and it must have been about, I've got about 2,000 files. It's, it's taken years. Yeah, I, I um, actually, I don't like digital at all, so I, I have all my cassettes still in a cardboard box, and every, I was, you know, I was always pretty meticulous. I, I kept a ledger of all the guests that ever came up to our radio show, all 12 years, you know, so, um, that that proved kind of valuable, like when Stretch and I would get interviewed, or even in retrospect, when Stretch would hit me up, be like, "Yo, Bob, I got a cassette with, uh, I don't know, whoever." And and he bit, D. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, you know, I was looking at the thing, and I tell him what the date was. So <laughs> I don't know about whom me D. We don't we don't see each other that much, and when we do, it, we we have to make up for a lot of lost, a lot of lost, lost laughs. That's a lost laughs, lost laughs. Lost, can't do it. Let's try that one. I forgot about whom me. I don't have the date that whom me D. It's not on my calendar, but um, yeah, I got a lot of tapes. But people hit me up. I know I'm know this happened to stretch too. The craziest thing about doing a radio show is that you know, all these years later, at least once a week, someone e emails me. It's like, Yo, Bob, on August 23rd, 1994, at 4, 12 and 15 seconds, you and Stretch played this demo. Who What's, is it? Who is it? <laughs> like, Yo, my dude. Like, I have no idea. Stretch would play like. Dub plate, he would go to Brooklyn and get stuff pressed up, you know, at for Don, $50. At, at Don One Studios, which was run by Sugar Minot. So he could, 
scratch and I, yeah, I don't know. I didn't, wasn't writing stuff down. And no and, one was playing dub plates and, and hip hop. I was obviously that goes, you know, that's a whole dance hall tradition of that. But I was I was getting acetates pressed up just to mix records off cassette, and people were like, "What the?" And it was throwing DJs off because they would call up like, they "Yo, how does he have that?" They on vinyl? assumed that because it was being mixed that it was available at least you know from the label, and, and, it, and it wasn't. But you would record the highlights, so when something good was going to happen, he would press pause and engage yeah. record, but, whereas I was recording whole shows. And yeah. together we've got almost everything covered, but I'm still looking for the tape when Biggie was Hoofney up there D. the first time. Biggie featuring Humphney D. <laughs> Keep it real. Yeah, we don't have that. Don't That's have another that. a moment that, I, you know, it's amazing and God bless the dead, but when Biggie came up, I don't think we were like knowing that this dude is going to be like the next, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's a lot of moments that just passed by and we're like, wow. And then four years later, you're like back and like, oh snap. But that was a demo contest too, though, wasn't it? It was a demo versus demo. Biggie Smalls lost a demo contest to a group called Bronx Zoo. And he was mad as stretch. No, no, no. He uh, wasn't mad at me. He was mad at me? He was just crunchy. He was crunchy. He was a little crunchy at us. And I forget his name, but it was a friend of mine that was doing promotion at, at Arista. So he was on the on the promo bus. With Rob Biggie. Stone? Rob Stone. No, no, no. 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 Oh. Um, and uh, and if you look at the credits on on the back of Ready to Die, it's just filled with people within the circle that that you were talking about. All of our friends, and we're not mentioned. And that's because he was salty that he, he lost that battle. Apparently, he was so salty that he contemplated quitting. I mean, that was his first time on the radio, and he was. It, it really it, it shook him up that he lost this this demo to. To a group that was not signed and crazy story. nothing. Crazy story. Red Man put us like first on his thank yous, organized confusion, Fuji's. Fuji's. It's a lot of albums that thanked us. Black Moon was the first group to mention us on the record. Who got the props? Fat Joe, dedication. Anyway, that, that went off off your question. All right. Uh Hufnidi. Who was Hufnidi? Yeah, one more. I forgot who Hufnidi Nobody. Hufnidi, nobody. One what more about question. Dr. Hukupu? Dr. Hukupu. Pling plong. We're going right. over their hair. Their hair. Okay. Their head. One more question for you guys. Um, we know about, you know, some of the legends that you guys have been mentioning today. Yeah. Who are some of the uh, sleepers that came on the show that are, that are maybe some of your personal favorites that didn't quite get the acclaim of some of the other guys on the list? Cage, uh, we thought was one of those dudes that was going to be a Nas yeah. and never panned out. I mean, you know, he did well in the indie scene, um, but there's too many to mention. Uh, I think Raggedy Man was another dude that we looked at. Well, at least I did. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I thought Raggedy Man was brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, Last Emperor was brilliant. I mean, these are the dudes who have come with, with song concepts that were layered and, and sounded great, you know, projection, came to the studio, had an aura about them. But, you know, that's just, that's just, that was just the time, you know what I'm saying? Like, some people wound up blowing up. We couldn't, couldn't have predicted. Other people would be like, oh, he's nasty, and nothing would happen with them. So, You know, you, you always knew when an artist um, was really, was, I don't want to say, what? was successful <laughs> because they, they would sort of graduate from our show. You know, it usually... Big L was up there how many times? He came up four or five four, times. Four or five times. And that was that's probably about, about the most. You know, he was local though. He lived in Harlem, the station was in Harlem. But but you know, the artists would come through and then they would, you know, on their next next round they'd be doing commercial radio and then after that, you know, they were like, you know, in daytime rotation and, and it was cool with us. You know, we we got to see them, you know, spread their wings and fly. You know, the the artists that then there were the artists that never really met the com with commercial success and it was like, <laughs> here they are again. Hear that? And we were always there for them, but we just, you know, what? What's up? No. All right. Go ahead. <laughs> that was a good question. What's your name? Thumbs up. <laughs> you did a good job. 